Let's move on to the next section, pharmacology of an alkali disorder, naltrexona, camprosate, and disulfiram. So like I mentioned, you know, these medications are often underutilized. I think there are a couple of reasons for that. The first is that we know from epidemiologic studies that the majority of patients with substance use disorders don't get any type of formal treatment. This is just a reality that access to addiction treatment remains limited in many places. And so there's just not as many chances for patients to be considered for medications. Second is that even among those who do treat alcohol use disorders, clinicians actually don't often utilize them. And then the final thing is that compared to buprenorphine or methadone, which is used for opioid disorders, medications for alcohol are not as impactful and there's a perception that they're not as helpful. But what are the reason these medications I'm going to be talking about are effective, do help patients maintain their sobriety or reduce their heavy drinking? And so as much as possible, I think we should be utilizing them. So naltrexone is the first one I'll talk about. It's a semi-synthetic meopoid antagonist. In terms of its mechanism of action, it's considered to decrease the inhibition of GABA neurons that act to inhibit dopamine release in the mesolimbic reward pathway. But net effect is that it reduces dopamine release. It has a pretty short half-life, metabolized by the liver. It has an active metabolite, 6-beta-naltrexol, which has a longer half-life. The therapeutic dose is really 50 milligrams. Sometimes you can start with 25 and go up to 50. Many of the studies actually utilize a higher dose of 100 milligrams. But in clinical settings, really 50 milligrams a day of naltrexone is considered appropriate to start, and that's it. That's your target dose. The real main side effects that we worried about is somnolence and some GI distress that can occur, but it's overall well tolerated. Now, the PO version of naltrexone, because it's metabolized in the liver, can cause liver enzyme elevations and rarely hepatotoxicity and liver failure. Doing a baseline liver panel and monitoring that and on some frequency is very important. But the current thinking is pretty clear. The damage to the liver from the drinking itself far outweighs the risk of liver toxicity from the treatment itself. And therefore, if there's mild liver enzyme elevations at baseline, it's likely because of the drinking, and this should normalize under naltrexone. So like I mentioned, baseline LFTs are recommended, and then monitoring at regular intervals like every six months. Liver enzyme elevation up to three times upper normal limit will be considered okay as long as they're trending down. Because again, the risk of liver damage from naltrexone is much less than the risk of liver damage from ongoing alcohol use. And so if the medication is providing benefit, and as long as the liver markers are trending down, I would still utilize this medication. Hepatitis C is not an absolute contraindication. It warrants close monitoring. Another contraindication for naltrexone is that it's an opioid antagonist. Therefore, if the patient needs to be on opioids for whatever reason, whether that's acute pain treatment, chronic pain treatment, or things like buprenorphine or methadone, then it's contraindicated. The main clinical effects of naltrexone is that it reduces the subjective effects of alcohol caused by the net reduction in the dopamine release from alcohol. The reason why this works is that when patients have their first drink, it becomes subsequently harder to say no to the second drink. After the second drink, say no to the third is even harder and harder. There's a positive reinforcement. Naltrexone is actually reduces euphoric effects of alcohol such that it makes it easier to put down the second drink or the third drink. So it really seems to help reduce heavy drinking days, but also has an effect on the ability of the individual to maintain abstinence if they're trying not to drink at all. So the overall evidence base is that it does help reduce heavy drinking. It does help delay any drinking. And then overall, it can, again, the big impact is on reduction in heavy drinking. The evidence is really strongly supportive of naltrexone impacting heavy drinking days, but really it's considered appropriate for patients who are wanting to cut down or maintain their abstinence. And it's okay to start naltrexone even if the patient is still drinking. They don't have to first attain abstinence. But the overall benefit of naltrexone seems to be better if the patient is first able to attain abstinence for at least a couple days. Four days is sort of the cutoff. But whenever the patient is willing to start, in my mind, is actually okay. And even if the goal is to cut back, like I find that to be a still reasonable initial goal, they may not be the appropriate goal in the longer term, but any reduction in drinking has health benefits. And so I would never turn away a patient to say the only appropriate treatment goal is abstinence. Success in reduction in drinking actually may lead for the patient to be more confident in aiming for abstinence. Any reduction in the right direction is something that I would fully support. And if medications would help to do that, that's in my mind a good thing. There's naltrexone oral, but there's also the injectable naltrexone, which is a once a month medication that's a gluteal IM injection. And it's considered to be more effective than the PO version. 
overall, the total number of patients using this is relatively small. So the evidence base is not as definitive. But for many patients, just a once a month injection is much more convenient. And unlike the PO version, it has some signal that it really may support abstinence and not just reduction in heavy drinking days. So either is really a viable option for patients with alcohol use disorder, the oral or the intramuscular and naltrexone. Both are quite appropriate. There are times when clinicians utilize naltrexone as a PRN medications to use it only during high-risk situations. I've had patients who don't use naltrexone regularly, but if they're going to a celebration or a party, they know there'll be alcohol around, they don't want to sort of drink at all, or if they do end up drinking, they want to minimize it. So depending on the situation, there are times when I've recommended to patients that a PRN use may be indicated. But there's very minimal research on this type of approach, and majority of the research is really done in the context of regular daily dosing of naltrexone. The next medication that's FDA approved is acanaprosate. We don't have a good understanding of the mechanism, but we think it's a glutamatergic antagonist and a GABA agonist sort of modulates the GABA system and the maybe normalizes the glutamergic sort of excitation. There really are no drug-drug interactions that are known for acanaprosate. The effects of a campersate should kick in within a couple days. It's not like you have to wait a couple weeks. The dose that's used is 666 milligrams three times a day. Generally well tolerated. The most common side effects are the GI distress and diarrhea that can occur. And the biggest contraindication is kidney failure as opposed to liver failure in naltrexone. And so individuals with low creatinine clearance, actually less than 30, will be an absolute contraindication for a campersate. The main effect of acamprosate really seems to be in promoting and maintaining abstinence. It has an effect on reduction in heavy drinking days to some degree, but probably the biggest impact is on really sustaining abstinence and maintaining that. The largest U.S. trial for acamprosate called Project Combined actually failed to show acamprosate's efficacy over a placebo. But if you look at the overall evidence, including all the different trials, all the European trials, actually acamprosate comes out even better than naltrexone. There are mixed findings, but overall evidence does support its use. And so we would strongly encourage it. Just like with naltrexone, some period of absence prior to initiation seems to be a good thing. For example, after inpatient withdrawal management or clinical detox admission, a campersate is a good medication to start. Even if it's a small effect, we shouldn't discount it. Abstinence is really hard, even in, in motivated people. Even a small reduction in overall drinking, even a small improvement in abstinence is actually a great thing, especially from a public health perspective. Once you're able to sustain some abstinence, that gets people much more confident they can do this over the longer term. And just like with naltrexone, even if the short-term goal is not complete abstinence, any change in any reduction in alcohol is something that I support. Also for a campersate, two tabs, TID is a difficult you know, regimen to maintain. I maintain some flexibility around it. You know, if they have some side effects, reduction in the dose, one tab TID, or if they want us to do BID dosing, do three tabs BID. So I think there are multiple ways to kind of dose this, and I try to remain flexible with patients. And so the final FDA-approved medication is disulfiram. It is, inhibits an enzyme that breaks down acetaldehyde, the acetaldehyde dehydrogenase. And the reason why this works is ethanol is metabolized into acetaldehyde by the alcohol dehydrogenase. And then this acetaldehyde is further broken down into acetate by the acetaldehyde dehydrogenase. Disulfiram blocks the second enzyme. This leads to the accumulation of acetaldehyde, which causes a very unpleasant reaction, sometimes called a flushing reaction, nausea, headache, even hypotension. And it can be quite uncomfortable, usually not severe. It doesn't lead people to typically end up in the emergency room, but it's aversive enough to really be a deterrent. So this has been around for a long time, and it is an FDA-approved medication and uh, relatively well-tolerated at the target dose, which is 250 milligrams once a day. Historically, higher doses were utilized, but the higher doses are more prone to cause cognitive problems like delirium or even psychosis, and therefore the lower doses are recommended. Now, rarely it can cause liver failure, and so liver monitoring just like naltrexone is actually important. The reason why psychosis has been a problem is that disulfiram also inhibits another enzyme, dopamine beta-hydroxylase. And this is an enzyme that breaks down dopamine, and therefore disulfiram can actually increase dopamine levels in the brain. This is actually another reason why disulfiram has been tried as a treatment for stimulant use disorders, because in those situations, dopamine may be helpful. Therefore, this medication is contraindicated in individuals with a psychotic disorder. And this is actually a frequent board-type exam question, the interaction of disulfiram and psychotic disorders. 
Now, this is a medication where patient selection is important. You don't want patients who are very impulsive and are really unable to control their drinking despite taking medications because of the adverse reactions. And so typically, this is reserved for more motivated patients. And one approach that can really improve the outcomes of disulfiram is to combine behavioral couples therapy where the patient's spouse or family member actually administers the disulfiram each day, create this sort of accountability. And so for motivated patients or patients where you can incorporate behavioral couples approaches, this is actually a viable option to consider. Now, overall, these are sort of the FDA-approved medications and are considered first line. But because of patient selection and other issues, naltrexone and acamprosate really are the two sort of go-to medications for alcohol use disorder. There are many patient factors that you would take into account, patient preference, prior response to these medications, contraindications, and comorbid conditions. But in reality, I always tell people, whichever medication the patient is willing to take is the best one because that's the one they're going to take. And uh, again, any help in recovery is, I think, a good thing. And so we should utilize them where appropriate. So key points for the section are, naltrexone main effects are to reduce heavy drinking days, but also to help promote abstinence and reducing cravings, caution for those with liver dysfunction. Acamprosate, another FDA-approved medication, can promote abstinence and reduce cravings. Without any drug-drug interactions, it's a fairly safe medication to use, but caution in those with kidney dysfunction. Disulfiram is also a viable option, but patient selection for those who are highly motivated is actually quite important. 